Aries 16 to 20. This expression is called attainment. And we do have this sense in Aries of, of wanting to achieve and to be something. And this inevitably happens when drive into the world develops an honor and an ability to lead and command. You're bound to actually be aiming to attain in the world. And on the first level of comprehension, this would mean fame and fortune, position and wealth and so on. But we're, we're taking it a little bit beyond that level because we're studying the mysteries. We're studying how to integrate our spiritual knowledge in worldly affairs successfully. So when we consider what attainment actually means on, on the higher levels, from the soul's perspective, it isn't to do with fame and fortune at all. In fact, it's quite a lot to do with not being caught up in fame and fortune. In the, um, the last study, we, we looked at the 15th degree being this, um, this sense of being surrounded by a robe of light, that we're beings of light. And in the 16th degree, the first degree of this particular expression of attainment, we're talking about brownies dancing in the setting sun. These are innocent children um, with a sense of mystery that happens at dusk. If, if you go into a, a forest, perhaps, at that time, there's this very subtle awareness of, of something mystical. It's, it arises, and it's predictable. It arises when certain features, certain ingredients are present. And at dawn and at dusk, we have this balance between light and darkness just hovering around the equilibrium point. The balance between the two opposites always always worth noticing that. That's what we're after. That particular point of balance between the darkness and the light, which we have at, at dawn and at dusk. So here are the brownies, innocent children, not yet corrupted by the awful heaviness of this world of lies. They're playing, they're dancing, they're, they're just aware that there's this energy in, in the world, in, in, in reality, and, and what, what would you do but dance? I mean, you, you don't need to explain why you dance. You need to explain why you don't. And kids don't explain anything. They just do whatever is obvious. And so they're dancing because they feel this energy where you can balance the light and the darkness within yourself. And they understand that the balance is a higher wisdom than the light itself. Light has, has, has this reputation of being good and everything we want, and darkness is not. That's really nonsense. That is so, so counterproductive. Darkness isn't evil. It really isn't. It's not bad. It's not to be avoided. It's just wrong when it's out of balance. If there's darkness and no light, then yeah, that's out of balance. That's unbalanced. But light without darkness is unbalanced as well. You have to find a way to assimilate the, the darkness. So what do we mean by darkness? Um, the unconscious elements within, the, the elements that you don't understand, the elements that you, you feel are bubbling up within you and want out. But your, your finger wagging is saying, no, 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 that's animal nature. That's wrong, therefore. But that, that's conscience imposed upon us by the society that we live in, which is collectively afraid of self-expression. It's become untrusting towards the individual. And you could say, well, for good reason. Well, now, yes, but not originally. Um, we have to reclaim the part of us that's been repressed and denied and suppressed by the finger-wagging authority of society and civilized behavior. 
and these people that live in their little boxes in their cul-de-sacs and they go to work and they get salaries and they do as they're told from 16 to 65 and, and, and that's what they think of as life. Those are the people responsible for stopping us from being free and this freedom is is obviously made known to us through the brownies dancing. These These young kids are just having a great time because why wouldn't you? Um, so Aries 16 is all about this um, ability we have to um, resonate with, with mysticism in life, to pick up on the fact that life is actually mysterious, that the, the clenching, the, the suppressing, the, the civilization energy is, is got out of hand. Up to a point, very helpful. Beyond a certain point, no life denying and so airy 16 is saying like, like you know i i, I can feel it <laughs> I'm, I'm robed in light i'm a being of light i you can't deny what i can feel i know life is mystical and you're not going to stop me dancing so that's airy 16. now airy 17 is um this is the prim spinsters and very often the the second degree of a, a batch of five it's a contrast to the first one, so you can't think of a, a more contrasted image to these kids having a great time in the woods, to these two prim spinsters who don't do anything ever, but they, they stay indoors and have many, many cups of tea all day talking to each other about exactly the same thing. It, it really does seem like a life-denying image, but it's, it's not to them. And I think we need to understand that we, all of us, have a prim spinster. Now, the primness is, is just like, no, no, we don't do that kind of thing. That's, that's a way of establishing boundaries. You, you, you surround yourself with a wall so that the dark, distorted energies of the world of lies can't disturb you over much. You protect yourself from the grim reality of how far this world has sunk. So the primness is a part of that. Um, the fact that they're in solitude is another part, that they've got a door that they can lock, that they, they don't have any friends, nobody can come knocking on their door, nobody can make a phone call, and you know, they, they just don't want to be intruded upon. That's what the primness is about. And the spinster is the same thing. <clears throat> they've um, not gone into one-to-one one, one -to -one relationship. Um, wanting to be who they are, not a half of a couple. I am this, you know. Now, they've got a companion, but that's not the same thing as a partner. So we're differentiating here between the relationship of surrendering to a partnership, which most people do, and that makes sense to have kids, make the kids feel loved and secure. But if you don't go that direction, if you actually insist on trying to feel this mystery in life, this lovely mystical energy that the Aries 16 people know about, if you insist on feeling that, then you have to, in some way, veil yourself, guard yourself away from the world, even to the point of living in seclusion. Some people do that in cloistered way, monks and nuns and so on, and, and they're not lifeless at all. You see the eyes of a monk or a nun, and they're shining with light. They've got it, and, and they haven't a one-to-one -one relationship. They give that energy to God, and they have their own way of being, and, and they learn how to fully enjoy the mystery of life through seclusion. So this is a counter-distinction to Aries 16. Aries 17 is about not dancing, it's just holding yourself inward and allowing the, the inner sense of self, the place you go to on retreat, you turn within and you find out who you are when alone, when there's no diets, um, there's no rhythms, there's no conversations other than those that you impose upon yourself.
So you just subject yourself to your own disciplines of, of diet and rhythm and practice, and you find out who you are. Now, either of those two conditions is somewhat excessive. The dancing all the time or the solitary life forever is a bit excessive. So the balance is to be found in the next degree. And um, Aries 18 is the, the hammock image. Um, the understanding here is that there's a time to work and there's a time to play, a time to rest, a time to just be. So this is to do with the balance between doing and being. It is a balance that we need to find. We're conditioned within the modern world to be doing. What are you doing? What do you do? You know, um, we don't really ever ask the question, well, who are you being? What are you being at the moment? We don't ask that. Always, what are you doing at the moment? And this linguistic clue shows us that we consider doing to be the appropriate thing and being to be not. <laughs> you, you may sort of wag your finger at somebody and say they're lazy if they're concerned only with being. And um, it's not fair, you know. What is fair and good and right and helpful is the balance between doing the work and then having time off, resting, relaxing. And this downtime, as it's called, is, is not unproductive at all. That's the access that you have to inner presence and through that to some kind of inspired wisdom. If you spend time alone and you relax to some extent, going for walks, meditating, pottering around, you, you kind of, you find your mind is actually still more often and it expands to make patterns that you couldn't normally see. You, you understand life a little bit differently and, and perhaps more fully because of this capacity you have to balance natural rhythms within. And um, the, the mind which is normally grasping, the monkey mind, just gets a thought and, and works with it and, and, and thinks about it and has other points of view and gets involved in conversation and says everything it knows in one sentence and, you know, it is this monkey mind. Well, that stops us from opening the subtle mind. And the subtle mind has a greater horizon and a greater oceanic depth of potential. You can't understand the meaning of life by thinking about it. That's obvious, surely. And if you try and think your way philosophically to the, the meaning of life, you'll never get there. I studied, I got one of these little um, abridged versions of philosophers of, 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 you know, all time, really. And I studied a hundred philosophers from Heraclitus through Socrates to Plato and Aristotle up to including Nietzsche and Bertrand Russell. And I, almost all of them thought their way into some confused state of saying this is true and that's not and so on. Not one of them really got it, not, not for my money. I, I think Plato and Socrates made it pretty clear um, and Aristotle, those three between them, they'd sorted out what could be sorted out, and all the rest of them just, yeah. They didn't think it through, not thoroughly. Hegel did pretty well, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. I, I do like that one. Um, but the rest of them, they spent all of their life, for millennia we're talking, <laughs> thinking about the meaning of life. It's not available through thought. The grasping mind cannot understand the meaning of life. We need to rise above that. And the magic carpet image shows us how to do that. It's, it's fanciful, isn't it? A magic carpet. You know, there isn't such a thing, not in reality. But the reality that that refers to is physical reality, the measurable reality. There is another reality that we go to when we go to sleep. That's real. We, the dream world is real to us when we're there. 
And that reality exists in Sufism. It's called the astral plane. And we can just take our mind above this earthly world where logic and reason and rationality and explanations are required. And we can move to this different state of mind where it's not required. And, and, and the mind just dreams. It expands. And that's where dreamers live. That's where true poets and artists and visionaries get their inspiration. They take their minds to that, that plane of existence. That's what the magic carpet refers to, just allowing yourself the possibility of, of dreaming. And it bubbles up necessarily. It's not something you have to aspire towards. How do I learn to dream? It's not like that. What you do, you have to stop the grasping mind, the monkey mind, from its busyness. And this is done by breathing. You just learn how to breathe very slowly, very deeply. And you don't think about anything but I'm breathing. And then you, you, you get to a state eventually, I mean, you, with practice, it'll feel a lot easier. You can do it more or less at will when you've practiced it. But eventually you get to that state of like, oh, I'm aware of my mind, but it's not focused on anything. And if you're in that state, you're in this state of the subtle mind. And it's, 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 it's image is like Aries 20, the innocent girl feeding the birds. She doesn't think why she's feeding the birds. She doesn't even really concentrate on the fact that she's feeding the birds. She's just innocent and in this state of grace. So there are birds, here is food, they deserve to be together, that's what's happening right now. Um, she, she doesn't think that she's buying the food, she's putting herself into harm's way by being out in public and feeding birds who might peck her finger, she doesn't think about any of that. She's just in this state of mystical awareness that, that arises when the mind is in the level of subtle mind. And so she feeds birds. And that's the level of attainment that we're actually after, where we don't have to think about doing the right thing. We just do the right thing because we're in the state of being, where doing the right thing is just what you do. Um, <laughs> And, and it's not only about feeding birds and helping the needy. That's, that's one example and a good example, and perhaps the example that's most important to underline. But what we do, we do what's appropriate in every moment. Sometimes we create strong boundaries because that's the appropriate thing to do. And sometimes we relax all of our boundaries and share all of our wealth with somebody who's needy. And we just don't bother to think it through. That is attainment. And when we're in that state, when we've mastered that state of attainment, in other words, we do the right thing, come what may, simply because we're masters of attainment, then something mystical occurs. And you have to have trust in this, that you just do the right thing all the time, and things unfold in front of you that you seem to have authored but it didn't feel like you were initiating anything it's just like this energy comes through you and balances the situation let's talk about that for a minute this ability that we can develop to balance the situation in in sufism we study the four elements fire is energy and purpose water is sensitivity sensitivity Empathy, tuning in on that feeling level. Air is clarity of mind, explaining things, tuning in on the level of mental rapport. And earth is doing the necessary, making things work, bringing things to, to groundedness. All of those four are spiritual principles. None of those four is okay alone, not compared to the higher state of being, which is the mutual balancing of all four, where none, none of them is prominent for very long. It's a dynamic balance. And what a Sufi learns to do is to hold that state within. 
understanding, this, this state where all four are in balance is called ether. And what a Sufi tries to do is to enter a situation and just like tune in and feel the balance of energies. Don't think about, oh, which is fiery, which is watery. Don't think that way. It just like allows a situation to influence his way of being and responds appropriately. And automatically, as it were, it's not really automatic, it's conscious, but it's not It's not requiring a result, it's just conscious of <clears throat> the existence of ether within and the knowledge that ether without will be an improvement in every situation. And then things just shh, find their own shape. Every situation just moves itself towards a balance of these four, ele four elements and it just resolves the situation. And then the situation unfolds and becomes what it can be potentially. And a Sufi's presence does that. Very little action, very little speaking is required. Just the presence of a real master. And I don't mean a student of Sufism like me. I mean a Sufi, like, you know, a real established guy. I've seen one at work. It's amazing. <laughs> it's really amazing. They just finesse situations and everything works. They mend everything. Natural healers by presence alone. So we're looking to attain to that state of ether consciousness. And Aries 20 is the finalization of that journey.